Verse 991. Thank you. 991. First Timothy 2, verse 3. 991. For this is a good, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will or who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is a verse I would like to take from this portion, but we can read verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom, a payment for all, to be testified in due time. So with those words in our minds, speaking of God, our Savior, who desires to have all men be saved, let's go back to Acts the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. Just a few pages back in your Bible. Acts chapter 8. We'll be reading at verse 4. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. 916. 916. Acts 8 and verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people were with one accord, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Verse 12, but when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Now we'll drop down a little bit farther in the chapter to verse 25. This is now speaking of Peter and John, the apostles. It says, and they, when they had testified and preach the word of the Lord, return to Jerusalem, and preach the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch, that is, a servant of the queen, simply, the, the queen of Ethiopia, of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of her treasure, of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet, then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept some, some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scriptures which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb, dumb or silent before his shearers, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, or justice was not done. Who shall declare his generation? For his life was taken from the earth. He was, he was killed. The eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, or I tell you, I ask you, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder or impede me to be baptized? Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ 
is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down, both of them, into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. The eunuch saw him no more. And he went his way, went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in Asotus, passing through. He preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. We have already heard this evening that wonderful verse from John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now we considered on Sunday evening that that was actually spoken to one individual, to Nicodemus. And possibly it wasn't until John sat down to write the gospel that those words were made widely and openly known. But you come to the end of the Gospel of Matthew as Mark, and you could even include Luke. You read the words of the Lord Jesus to his disciples just as he is going to back, uh, go back to heaven, to ascend up into heaven, go into all the world, and preach the Gospel to every creature, to every person, young or old. Go into all the world and preach the Gospel to everyone. And then in the reading that we have taken from 1 Timothy, Paul expresses it so clearly, the desire of God. What really interests heaven this evening? Well, I'll be very plain with you this evening. God isn't interested in wealth or riches. God isn't interested in the World Cup or the Stanley Cup or the Super Bowl. God isn't interested in any of that. But there is something that God is intimately interested in. It's you. It's you. God's desire is that all men would be saved. Maybe I said this the last time I was here, but I, I was just in O'Hare Airport again just a couple months ago. And it never ceases to amaze me all the people, all the faces, Coming and going, and every single one of those people is a stranger to me. I know absolutely no one there. And then there is the city of Chicago, and it just goes on and on and on. Hundreds of thousands of people, yet every single person is known by God. Not only are they known by God, they are loved by God. And the longing desire of the heart of God is for their salvation, for your salvation. You here in this meeting this evening, please understand something. That God is immensely interested in you, in your eternal well-being. Paul says it so plainly. The desire of God is that all men would be saved. As the Lord Jesus gave that commission to his disciples, beginning from Judea, from Jerusalem and Judea, and into Samaria that we have read, these men went out to preach the gospel. We can read here of Philip preaching in the city of Samaria. And it says that the people, notice the word, there is the multitude with one accord. They listened to the things which Philip spake. Not only was the word of God preached, but as we tried to share last night, the message of the gospel was received. There were people that took it for themselves, that Christ died for my sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised again the third day, according to the scriptures. And he lives to save those that trust him. There were those in Samaria that believed the gospel. And we read of Peter and John. They are preaching the word of the Lord. They preach the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. But then we have, as it were, a little bit of a parenthesis in verse 26 here. The Bible says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. In other words, where there are no cities. 
no cities, no villages, just a wasteland as it were. But there was going to be a man. Verse 27, and he arose and went and behold, a man. One man sitting in his chariot, returning from Jerusalem. I take it he was a man that was sincerely seeking out the truth of God. He had gone up to Jerusalem. He is returning now to Ethiopia. And he's going along. He is reading the word of God. And this speaks volumes to me of the desire of God, the interest of heaven in one individual, in one man. God's interest in you this evening that are sitting here in this meeting or listening online. Do not think that you are lost in the crowd. That you are some faceless nobody that is unknown and unloved by God. You are known by God and you are loved by God. And here is a man that God was going to search out. Because I take it he was a man who was sincerely seeking the truth. And there are two things that I could appreciate from this. Very simply, a man that was going to go to him, a man that was divinely guided by God, but really what God was going to use was the Scriptures. And I tell you, that is how God speaks to us today. As we heard in these meetings already, we are, we are nobody. We are simply the messengers carrying the message to you. Because if you are seeking the truth, if you are longing to know your sins forgiven, to be forever free from that burden of the wrath of God, let me tell you what you need is the Word of God. Maybe the problem is you do not understand it. And that's where we would seek to be of a help to you. Because that is exactly what Philip does. As he comes alongside this man's chariot, as he is reading the scriptures, he joins himself. He comes here and says, do you understand what you are reading? He says, how can I accept some man should guide me? Was this a coincidence? <laughs> and I tell you, this is because God's desire is that all men would be saved. One man in the desert. And Philip, as a divinely guided messenger, is sent to one man. A man who is searching out the truth is a man that is searching the Scriptures without understanding, reading this lovely portion from the prophecy of Isaiah, written some 700 or 750 years before the coming of the Lord Jesus, and yet detailing with such great detail the sufferings of someone. Someone that the eunuch did not know who. Who was led as a sheep to the slaughter. Whose life was so violently taken away from him. Whose life was cut off in his youth. And yet he does not open his mouth in defense. And Philip had the great privilege as we read in verse 34. I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this. Of himself or some other man. And Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture to preach unto him Jesus. Do you understand that there is a message of hope, a message of peace, a message of forgiveness found in him? Found in the one who was willing to go to Calvary's cross and suffer? Not because of crimes that he had committed, not because he himself was a violent man. The scriptures tell us he was as gentle as a lamb, without fighting, without presenting some defense of his own, but willingly going to be condemned by man, to be nailed to a cross, and there suffer not only at the hands of men, but actually suffer the wrath of God. Because in this very same section that this eunuch would have read, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned our own way away from God. And yet the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. We read of punishment that was meted out. In John 3.36, we have read of the wrath of God. 
That is something that is unalterable. That is fixed. God's absolute hatred for sin. In His wrath will without a doubt fall on those that reject the Lord Jesus as their Savior. It is an absolutely sure thing. And yet what we can appreciate this is this. As it were, the wrath of God was deviated from us to Him. The judgment of God that my sin deserved, friend, fell on Him. This is what transpired at Calvary on the cross. Maybe you are not moved by it. Maybe you've never come to understand the awfulness of your sin and the danger that you are in. And I tell you, for anyone whose sin becomes real to them, to hear that there was one that was willing to suffer for me, to save me from God's wrath, what an awesome truth that there was someone that could step in as my substitute. Someone else that was willing to suffer for me. That, friend, is the message of the gospel. That is what entered into the ears of this man that was searching for truth. The scriptures are opened. And his heart was open to receive the message. The Bible tells us that at that he opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Can I tell you this evening that to say that God's desire is that all men would be saved, they're not just simply words. When God is the one that put into effect this great plan of salvation at his own expense. John, the very uh, one who writes those words, John 3.16, he could tell us again in a later epistle, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. How much does God desire to save sinners? God was willing to send His Son to a, a cross of suffering, of shame, to pour out His wrath on the one that had so pleased Him all of His life. The one that had never failed, never rebelled, never sinned, never done anything. To deserve his wrath. And yet God was willing to pour it out on him. God is proving, God is displaying his love toward us. Even in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I hope you understand that God loves you. And God longs for your salvation. And God has done everything necessary to save you. And I remind you of something. If you have heard the gospel before, if you are not saved this evening, it is not God's fault. God is not withholding from you. God is not stingy with His offer of salvation. God's desire is that all men would be saved. That's you. That's every single person in this meeting that is not saved. God wants to save you, and God can save you. Christ has died. He has satisfied God. The punishment that our sin deserved was upon Him. Philip preached unto Him, Jesus. And though maybe there are some details that are omitted, we read here that this man comes to an awesome understanding. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Just exactly as we have heard John 3.16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Not just merely a man from Nazareth. Not just a Jewish man from from Galilee, but the Son of God that was sent to suffer in all of His innocence, that He is indeed the Son of God. I believe that He is the Son of God. And the Bible says this, What doth hinder me that I might be baptized? And both of them went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now we'll just take the time to tell you this, it is not His baptism that saved him, it was the Lord Jesus Christ that saved him. But this was a public identification with him. 
in understanding that the one who suffered and died and was raised again, he did that for me. The Bible tells us this, that Philip again is caught away, caught away to another city to continue preaching the gospel in other cities. But what a wonderful account of the grace of God that works in the saving of one man. Would it not be wonderful if God was to save one person in this meeting this evening? But maybe you're not interested. Maybe you're not interested, but let me tell you again, God is. God longs to save you and to forgive your sins. And I tell you the result again, as we've already appreciated this evening, as far as the eunuch is concerned. The Bible says this, he went on his way rejoicing. There's no greater joy than to know that God loved me and sent his son to die for me. That I will be saved forever from the awful wrath of God that my sin deserved. You know, it gives us joy for time. And for eternity, that is going to be the theme of our song. It is going to be what fills our hearts and our mouths. Praise to the Son of God who loved me, who washed me from my sin in His own blood. Friend, understand that God wants to save you. God is not withholding. God is offering us such a, an awesome price the forgiveness of sins, and you can have it this evening. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you as an individual will be saved.